Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ağudu billahi minşeytanir racim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Salatu ve salamu ala Resulillah ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men tabi'ahu bi ihsanin ila yevmiddin. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you everyone for joining this uh, first webinar. Uh, a webinar or and more like a meeting now uh, with uh, uh, Professor Dr. Jess Rauda. And the, uh, the, this is the, the topic. Uh, uh, the agenda for this meeting will be uh, like this. So I'll just uh, very briefly introduce what is it that we're trying to do, what is the, the, about the research forums. Uh, and what are the objectives that uh, we are, uh, we would like to uh, to achieve via these uh, these research forums and uh, why is the need and uh, you know in the, the objectives and then uh, dr motaz uh, dr muktam motaz uh, our uh, colleague in uh, in jordan he will uh, introduce and uh, start the uh, the talk and will manage the talk also as a moderator inshallah uh, so uh, we will, uh, I guess, we will continue uh, moving people to promoting people to panelists, inshallah. All right. Now, uh, Alhamdulillah. First of all, I uh, again I thank everyone for joining this uh, this uh, this talk, this forum, and uh, I really appreciate. And this uh, this is uh, it was really a, uh, an interest, an amazing thing that uh, so many people were interested in finding out and uh, joining this uh, uh, joining this forum and uh, it, it shows that there, there is an interest in in the ideas of the uh, Makassit, uh, in the ideas that Makassit institute is trying to promote and uh, the uh, the reason uh, i was uh, me myself as uh, you know as a director of research and also deputy deputy executive director at Makassit institute uh, I, I, we were thinking of how to uh, encourage more uh, research using this, uh, uh, using the uh, Makassit methodology. Uh, and so uh, there are, of course, there, there are different uh, ways to do that. And one of the uh, one of the ways that we are promoting it is through the uh, Makassit methodology course, which many, uh, which we have already a second, um, we have a second cohort completing. Uh, completing the course uh, already, uh, alhamdulillah, and uh, we are going to continue into the next uh, next phase, inshallah. And the the last phase of all the uh, all this uh, educational courses, like you know, the first and the second, the third one will be, inshallah, the uh, research, uh, the actual actual research, inshallah. And they, there are, of course, there are de uh, a lot of reasons, a lot of uh, contemporary challenges that. Uh, uh, that are affecting science and research uh, research today, and uh, some of the uh, I, I can just enumerate probably some of them, and uh, many will uh, probably tell a few a few more. Uh, so the uh, number one, in my understanding, is the uh, the problem of uh, anthropocentric uh, view of the world, where we think the uh, us the humans we are the center, and everything is supposed to be uh you, you know serving uh, serving the human beings and uh, everything below uh, the human being is uh, is subservient to uh, to the humans and so it, it creates a lot of problems in uh, in our uh, economies in our ways of uh, ways of life and uh, in way we produce things and in way we uh, look uh, look at the science as well and how we how we do research and also there are other uh, other contemporary challenges like uh, postmodernism and posthumanism where uh, uh, this uh, could be uh, seen as the uh, opposites uh, whereby uh, either there is no uh, everything is relative we uh, we uh, there is no certainty in the world or uh, the uh, kind of posthuman or transhuman uh, uh, a human being which is uh, you know now is going to be more and more uh, uh, like uh, artificial intelligence induced and uh, help with uh, help with technologies and so on and so forth and uh, of course there are also problems with uh, narrow spe specializations uh, which are good in terms of uh, growth of the body of knowledge but then uh, once uh, once there is uh, too much narrow specializations going on 
then we uh, we can kind of go uh, too far away from the uh, uh, from the fundamentals, uh, from the uh, from the ideas, from the fundamental ideas that uh, uh, that are supposed to uh, you know bind us together as uh, as human beings, as uh, as people, and carry us uh, forward, inshallah, as uh, as species living among other species and uh, following and uh, trying to uh, uh, fulfill the uh, uh, the the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for and uh, so the narrow specializations and uh, you know the limited methodologies and the methodologies that uh, Pro, uh, uh, Prof. Jasser will be uh, also uh, will mention also that there are uh, there are limitations in contemporary Islamic studies and uh, this is what we would like to correct and so because of all of this we see that there is a need for comprehensive uh, revelation centric and maqasid based approach in education research and action and all of this with a um, uh, future oriented and uh, critical uh, and critical lens and so the objectives of this of these research forums and this is the first in the series inshallah we uh, we would like to uh, continue uh, these uh, monthly monthly research forums and uh, the original word that I used was colloquium, I, but uh, some people I think <laughs> cannot pronounce this word correctly. So uh, let's let's stick to the word forum. And the the objective of these research forums is uh, number one is to affect to affect the adoption of the Makassit methodology in the research community. Uh, then uh, also to test and enhance the utility of the Makassit methodology in theoretical and applied research. Uh, also to serve as an interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary discussion uh, discussion platform for researchers in uh, in academic and applied fields, and also as a, as a platform for discussions between uh, subject matter experts and methodology experts, and also to encourage the re research from inter and transdisciplinary perspective and uh, to promote the revelation centric vision of uh, Islam and Tajdeed. And so uh, this, uh, these are the, the broad uh, kind of objectives of, uh, of these research forums. And inshallah, hopefully every month we will uh, continue uh, uh, inviting scholars and inviting researchers to, uh, to present and to talk uh, about those, about the research, the research questions and problems that uh, they would like to, uh, that, that they are researching. And so, uh, without further ado, maybe uh, let me uh, transfer to uh, my brother, Dr. Mautaz, Mautaz Ablaher. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aldous. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, nice to have you in this first session of uh, this uh, promising series, inshallah. And it's our pleasure to have uh, our Sheikh and Ustad, Dr. Jasr Auda, in, in, uh, at, the, at the first session of these sessions. And actually, uh, when I read the, the title of this session, uh, Research via Maqasid Methodology from Multidisciplinarity to uh, Transdisciplinarity, uh, the first thought come to my uh, head that it's not just only some thoughts or techniques, Sheikh Jasser will share it with us, but I think it's uh, a life journey because his personal uh, uh, career development coming from disciplinary to multidisciplinary to a transdisciplinarity uh, uh, approach. Uh, since Dr. Jasser starting his life with, uh, with engineering, uh, uh, let's say certificate and uh, during his his uh, he uh, earned two PhD. The first one in the uh, philosophy analytics, as I, as I remember, or the system analysis, some, something like this, yeah. And in the uh, and the second uh, PhD in the Islamic law. So we are here trying to uh, hear from him about his life uh, journey and in the same time his vision. Uh, uh, how how we can achieve this, uh, or how we can apply the Maqasid methodology uh, from uh, multidisciplinarity to uh, transdisciplinarity. Uh, so I will give you the floor directly, Sheikh Jasser, and the uh, mic is yours. Uh, in the first part, we will uh, hear from you, and then we will open the, the Q&A for the comments, uh, uh, questions, and uh, any, any contributions from the colleagues here. So... Please, Mike is yours. Barakallahu feekum, Akhi. Barakallahu feekum, Dr. Mu'taz. Barakallahu feekum, Dr. Ildous. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أسعد خلقه وخاتم رسله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله ورضي الله عن مهاجرين والأنصار ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد It is such a pleasure to see another project of the Maqasid Institute, now the research forum. And I think it is a brilliant idea to bring people to talk about re the research and to um, interact and to think together. And uh, as well as the idea of discussing the Maqasid methodology, that the Maqasid Institute is promoting in terms of a research methodology that we're calling for researchers to adopt and to benefit from and to critique and to use. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless this forum and will make it very useful for those who attend. I am honored to start this forum to talk about my own research. And as Dr. Mu'taz mentioned, uh, my own journey, uh, this multidisciplinarity to transdisciplinarity has a lot to do with the journey uh, for knowledge that I tried to take from the times when I used to live in different worlds. Each world has a different silo. Uh, you see the world of fiqh, which has to do with our ummah, how it thought and how the scholars are debating things uh, several centuries back um, when I started as a kid to study fiqh al-shafi'iyya I basically looked at um, the Qalyub al-Umayra al-Hawashi ala manhaj al-Talibin so you're talking about somebody living in in a few centuries back and just thinking with this language and talking to this language. At the same time, when I was a kid trying to memorize the Quran, I could see the difference between the Quran and the fiqh that we used to study and to sit down and define water in like three months. Uh, so instead of um, the very narrow and archaic and Middle Ages kind of thinking, the Quran is different, you know, even though I memorize it without the fiqh of it. And then I got into listening to some of the scholars of the tafsir uh, who opened my mind, you know, talking about as, as a teenager to really try to look at the Quran and try to apply the Quran to this fiqh that I'm studying. My brother mentioned that I studied engineering in the early days, and this was a different world because you are really studying at that time uh, theories uh, of communication and physics and so forth from basically American textbooks. And the ethics of it was also from the American textbooks and management and so forth. And therefore, you are in a different world that has a different discipline and, and a different philosophy, a different approach uh, to life. Uh, eventually, when I studied systems, and I also studied usul al-fiqh, uh, even though I was a graduate student in both, and then eventually teaching both, I was actually, uh, I had some sort of an intellectual schizophrenia, um, because I am teaching uh, systems analysis and design uh, with the objectives uh, of artificial intelligence at that time, back in the 90s. And, and when I'm teaching usul al-fiqh, I'm talking about al-qiyas wa ta'lil and so on. And my thesis in usul al-fiqh was on al-ta'lil. And that's a very different logic and a different approach. Uh, yes, I used to teach the Greek logic in the uh, when I was an artificial intelligence guy. And I, I taught a few courses, introduction to logic and introduction to uh, logical thinking and logical systems and so on. And that's when I started to say, ah, okay, so usul al-fiqh is actually going by the Greek logic. And that's, I could see Aristotle in, in what I'm teaching uh, in, in artificial intelligence versus the, the logic in usul al-fiqh. And I'm saying, oh, okay, so that, that is where they get this funny logic. But of course, for those of you who know, if you are an artificial intelligence person, you develop your logic at that time back in the 90s 
we studied fuzzy logic and uh, non-modal logic, etc., like all, all sorts of new kinds of ways of looking at logic uh, from the critique of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Hazm to Aristotle uh, to Russell and the shift he made. And then so, and then I would tell myself, oh, why isn't Usul al-Fiqh catching up with the new logic? You know, it's not even catching up to Russell or uh, or the the new guys, the systems people. So I I wrote then my PhD trying to update the logic of the Usul al-Fiqh with the systems thinking, and that's when I started to be multidisciplinary. You know the silo of the systems thinking and the silo of usul al-fiqh. But then, as uh, he mentioned in the introduction, eventually I realized that the silos of the disciplines are going to be uh, restricting to the thinking. If you want to think in terms of the Quran, like if you want the Quran to be your drive for generating knowledge, uh, that is not going to happen within a discipline or within multidisciplinarity, as in, uh, in my case, usul al-fiqh and systems thinking or systems um, analysis as a discipline now in Western academia. And th this um, would, would, would make you apologize for certain things that the disciplines consider to be sacred uh, or considered to be fundamental or epistemological as they say and they, they this will make you build uh, on more than one discipline but without merging the knowledge really uh, why because you're not going back to a higher methodology a higher approach a higher epistemology really uh, that defines your knowledge and defines how you approach things. The Maqasid methodology is just a tool of trying to make people think of producing knowledge in terms of the Quran. And we have not been producing knowledge based on the Quran for a few centuries as Muslims. Uh, we are producing a lot of knowledge uh, today, alhamdulillah, and I could see a lot of forums and so on, but we are not producing knowledge based on that book. And I don't wanna be too, I don't wanna be too harsh and say that we never produce knowledge based on that book. It's not like that, but we haven't been centralizing the Quran enough. Um, take one of, the traditional branches of knowledge, like usul al-fiqh, as I mentioned. Where is the Qur'an there? You know, yes, they say, okay, the Qur'an was sunnah. And then how do you deal with the Qur'an and sunnah? You get into the lalat al-alfaq, and wal-am, wal-khas, wal-mutlaq, wal-muqayyad, wal-nasikh, wal-mansukh. That is Greek. That, that is not Qur'anic. And the Qur'an, if you really want to take it as, as your approach, uh, to usul al-fiqh doesn't deal with the Quran this way and doesn't deal with the sunnah this way. And uh, look at the, the hadith from the definition of the Sahabi all the way to, you know, al-rijal and al-irsal and tadlis. This is not Quranic, not even how they define the Sahabi based on the Quran. And then al-ijma' wal-qiyas, what is the Quranic basis of ijma' You know, the, what is this? This is a very weak argument for Ijma'. Anybody who is into Usul Fiqh would know that. And then Al Qiyas, how do you how do you justify Al Qiyas as uh, as an organ? You know, ala, you know, read Al Ghazali, for example. This is Greek. Again, this is not how the Quran do Qiyas. And Ibn Taymiyyah was right that the Quran is more about Qiyas al Awla. Uh, or the qiyas by the the, the preferred qiyas. It's so the, the non-systemized qiyas, not as uh, Ghazali put it, you know, case number one and case number two and illa number one and illa number two, as if you're talking about a machine. This is exactly the way we used to program in, what was that again, prologue and these programming languages when we used to program robots. 
that's how they they theorized about the qiyas and then al istislah wal istihsan wa amal ahl madina like how how is this relating to the quran and where is the fiqh of the quran falawla nafara min kulli firqatin minhum ta'ifa liyatafaqahu fi al-din where is the fiqh of the quran in usul al-fiqh that there are links but but very loose so for example and when you talk about the islamic history and how it is wrote, is written for example where is the quran in the methodology of applying the islamic history and why aren't we judging the different eras uh, that we are talking about in history based on the quranic criteria for history there is a lot of history in the quran and there is a lot of methodology of history uh, but when we studied history from the islamic point of view we focused on the political history we glorified the states uh, that are more violent and more expansive and the gold and silver and the palaces and the uh, concubines and we did not glorify the enemies of the state for example sometimes that were trying to reform to a better way and we did not take a quranic approach uh, to history to a great extent allahumma maybe ibn khaldun in his muqaddimah and then you could start to see some of the influences of the quran in the sunan al-ilahiyya and the tadawul and so on and some but then he went into the asabiyya and that is not quranic and then I, when you so what i am saying is we should as an ummah go back and t- try to produce knowledge based on the book of allah and we have not been doing this for a few centuries at least and that is why we're centralizing the book of allah the quran in our humble attempt to call the ummah to do research and this we are trying to give guidelines uh, i will share with you a slide and i will talk about the methodology for those who haven't been uh, with us taking the course uh, that we offer the graduate course or for those who, who have taken the course but they need a refresher perhaps i for a few minutes remind you of the steps that we are promoting for the maqasid methodology but these steps are not an algorithm they are just calling you to think and to centralize certain ideas as you do research uh, and we're trying to put this forward as uh, guidelines uh, if you wish uh, for 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 research for those who want to take an islamic research uh, islamic approach to research but again these are not necessarily uh, algorithmic steps that you follow and we're not this is not what we were talking about let me share a little bit of uh, the uh, t- to revise this is based uh, on that book uh, the re-envisioning islamic scholarship maqasid methodology as a new approach and everybody in the maqasid institute has participated in this book and especially in the introduction i mentioned a few names uh, dr basma abdullah far is with us on this forum uh, participating in in basically writing this book in english and uh, dr mu'taz uh, remembers uh, many hours that we spent discussing the ideas the first draft in arabic and many of you here on the list have participated dr eldous and dr zaid and so forth uh, and and uh, sister hiba etc everybody participated in this so this i could claim to be a collective work of what the institute is trying to promote and i advise each of our attendees if you haven't read this book and you're interested in maqasid methodology uh, or the work of the maqasid institute please uh, we can send you a copy in any way just contact us so i am talking about these areas that we developed at the end of the book in terms of studies and we thought that islamic studies cannot be continue to be defined in a secular way as we are now so today we define islamic studies as clergy producing kind of dini versus madani uh, you know islami versus non islami or duniawi world versus religion kind of islamic studies and this is secular and this is not the islamic world view secular in the sense of 
centralizing the material view of the world. So if you study economics or architecture, or politics or policy, if you want to go and be an engineer or doctor, psychologist, whatever it is, you go to uh, the European textbooks or the Japanese textbooks or any of that. But if you want to be a sheikh and play the role of clergy or um, basically the religious authority in a society, then you go and study Islamic studies. So we're saying, no, we should not do that. Islamic studies should have disciplinary studies. So engineering and science and applied science and uh, so forth, you know, humanities should be part of Islamic studies. Islamic studies is not under theology, under humanities, under, yeah, you know, it's not like that, but should be uh, part of that. And uh, we, we call the Islamic sciences that are close uh, to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that, that deal with the Quran and Sunnah directly or restructure the Quran and Sunnah and the knowledge that is tied to that, uh, as in Ilm al Kalam and Usul al Fiqh and Usul al Hadith and so on. We call them Usul al Studies just to divide. But you can see that these circles here are intersecting. We're not saying that these are disciplines. We're saying that these are just directions, uh, trends rather than disciplines. And then phenomena studies, again, it's intersecting with all of these. And we're saying that it's better to approach the world in terms of phenomena. And that's the transdisciplinarity that we're talking about versus approaching the world in terms of disciplinary. There is a difference between looking at the pandemic from a medical sciences perspective versus looking at the pandemic as a phenomena. And therefore you look at the medicine of it, but you look at the politics and the economics and the society, and you look at everything that is related to the pandemic. There is a difference between looking at poverty from a phenomena perspective. So how do you define poverty and what is related to poverty versus looking to poverty from an economic lens, because economy is not a science that is designed to eliminate poverty. Economy has nothing to do with poverty. In fact, ec the economic sciences are tools for establishing poverty uh, and maintaining poverty and so forth. If you wanna be a bit more critical of the sciences that are there out there. Therefore, we are trying to migrate our researchers from disciplinary studies towards phenomena studies. And we created an area that we call strategic studies in order to think strategically, uh, long-term, wide, et cetera. And we thought that the Maqasid thinking would help with the strategic thinking. Now, this is the generation of fiqh that we are talking about, how to generate fiqh. And fiqh is not legislation. We're not talking about tashri'a here. We're, this is different. We're talking about fiqh as an understanding of the Quran that is applied to phenomena in the reality. And that is the transdisciplinarity that we're talking about. Uh, and we said, okay, let us have five steps. But again, this is not an algorithm. And you're not supposed to look at these in terms of silos of steps, but rather um, intersecting and interacting, uh, up, you know, proposals that we're making. We said that the first element is to define a purpose versus defining a problem. And that is important if you want to take a Quranic perspective to your research, because once you define a problem, then you are a um, you are imprisoned in a particular approach, a particular discipline. If you define a problem without having a purpose defined, so you are a researcher in a particular university and you are studying psychology and your problem definition is based on the premises of that discipline. Uh, so your, your problem definition uh, is, is depression, let's say, uh, and how, how to deal with depression. Um, this is an erroneous start of your research because 
where did you get the term depression from? And what are the theories upon which you based your definition of depression? And what is your purpose of that? The purpose when you deal with psychological sciences that deal with counseling and so on, the higher purpose is the service of the society um, in terms of the a good citizen kind of purpose. So you, the end result of your research when you go to a counselor, the counselor is trying to make you part of the society, of, of a social structure that 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 we have in any society and therefore the higher purpose of the dealing with you uh, in terms of psychology that people research when they research depression has to do with being able to function in the society but to function for what purpose and to do what and 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 what are the higher objectives is not really part of that so when you deal with a discipline and you have a question, a research question, the research question, even if it sounds appealing from an Islamic point of view, it would be erroneous to do that without having a purpose. Like, why am I studying that? What are the higher purposes? Okay, higher purposes, I want to please Allah and I want to go to Jannah when I die. Okay, and what does this mean? at a lower level of maqasid, a lower level of objectives. What am I trying to do exactly in terms of knowledge and so forth that is going to be inspired uh, by the Quran, by the book of Allah? So that's why we're saying here that uh, the, we're saying here that the purpose is just one step and you have the second step, the Quran and the Sunnah and the cycles of reflection. But these two steps are not separate because once you open the book of Allah and you try to connect it to the model of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your purposes are going to develop. Your purposes are going to, to start to be different. Uh, your purposes in life, your purposes from your research, and the purpose is going to affect the way you look at the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the question I get all the time, so I open the Quran, what tafsir do I, do I use? And of course not, this is not, this is not a tafsir lesson. You, you open the Quran and look at the, the framework that we're talking about in order to have a purpose of your research. Oh, but I'm not qualified to give fatwa. Well, who asked you to give fatwa? We're not, you're not going to divide inheritance or, uh, you, you know, deal with a court in a divorce case. If you are a psychologist or an architect, if you are an artist or a, a, a mother who is opening the book and trying to see how can she deal with her children, you are not going to give fatwa about that. This is different. So my point is that the legalization of Islam and the fiqhization, if you wish, of, the, of Islam has been too much and has influenced our reading of the Quran. And people read the Quran and they think that they are just do ibadah, but they don't really want to look at ideas uh, in, in the Quran. And it is highly untapped and uh, so much there of ideas that has have not been explored that we need. And there is no other way of our ummah to stand on its feet until we go back to the Quran and build our sciences on that, build our architecture, uh, our military sciences, our management sciences, our psychology. It doesn't mean that we don't benefit from the others, but this is here, uh, the critical studies of literature and reality. We There is one step where you look at literature and you look at the reality and we try to benefit from the wisdom of humanity, but the Quran and Sunnah have to be centralized in the way you approach. And then there is a lot of talk about the relationship between the Sunnah and the Quran that we covered for those who have taken the course with us in the Muqassid Institute or other universities. There, this is a technical topic because not every hadith that you find out there is actually correct or is narrated well 
and is not sliced to fit a particular context, and it's supposed to fit a different context. And the hadith issue is a very complex issue. I would like for you to be very careful when you deal with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Not that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not a source of knowledge. Of course he is. He is our model Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his sunnah and following him is the way to success. But what do people say about Muhammad said? How do they narrate what he said? Is the, is the issue here. What are they saying? So, oh, what? What are you saying? So you're saying that Muhammad Sallallahu is asking us to put a sword on somebody's neck until they say la ilaha illallah. And if they say la ilaha illallah, they save their lives. And if they don't say la ilaha illallah, then you kill them. And like, is this what Muhammad said? Of course not. He didn't say that. That's your misnarration of Muhammad. So it's important that we look at that uh, in, in, in a critical way. And it is necessary that we respect uh, the scholars who are courageous enough to critique the hadith studies uh, of the past and of today so that we are able to read the Quran properly without the intervention that is a very uh, negative intervention of some of the narrations that are misnarrated. Uh, you read the Quran with a narration that is misnarrated. I was just talking the other day about And Nisa, verse number one, that he created you from one soul and created from her, uh, her mate uh, or her couple, Zawjaha. Uh, uh, and then you read the, the ayah with the hadith in mind that uh, Adam slept and uh, Allah created uh, Eve from his rib. So when you read, you are actually reading the hadith. You're not reading the Quran. The Quran is not saying a rib. And in fact, if you go to the hadith, the hadith has problems. And even the most uh, conserved scholars of hadith critiqued it. So this is a myth. Allah didn't create Eve from Adam's rib. Allah created Adam and Eve from nafsin wahida, one soul. If you look at the, at the verse, at the ayah, without the hadith that is Israeliyat, that is from the children of Israel, not from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you would read it properly. And you will start to look at nafsin wahidatin wa khalaqa minha zawjaha. It is one soul and Allah created from her. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu in his tafsir, for example, he said, it is very interesting that he said, وَخَلَقَ مِنْ هَا زَوْجَهَا He did not say, وَخَلَقَ مِنْ هُ زَوْجُهُ he's, he's not saying that he, he created uh, him, uh, created her from him. He's saying he created him from her. And then he said, what is that her? It is a nafs al-wahida. So nafs al-wahida, a one soul, وَخَلَقَ مِنْ هَا زَوْجَهَا And he created from her, that one soul, the, the couple. He created the couple together. That is, if you read the Quran without the impact of the misnarrations, I'm saying. And we have so much of that in the Quran that we read sometimes, we feel that we are reading, we're misreading because we have previous perceptions. Now, you look at the framework, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about. And we proposed, again, seven elements. And these seven elements, if you look at them, philosophically speaking or methodologically speaking, there is no difference between them. There, there are no silos between the concepts and the objectives uh, because the objectives are concepts and the concepts are objectives one way or the other. And the values are concepts and are objectives too. And the commands are not commands unless they have values and are not commands properly unless they have objectives and concepts, and they have to be compatible with universal laws. And the universal laws are also concepts and are also objectives and are also values. And when you define people into groups or parties, you are doing that based on concepts and objectives and, and values. And why are we naming them seven names? Because that's human language. Like we're just trying to say that when you read the Quran, uh, if you are a person who is more inclined towards objective thinking, you are going to see objectives everywhere. Even a concept, you will see it as an objective. A value, you will see it as an objective. But the objective-based thinking is very weak. 
in humanity. So we cannot just say be objective based. Otherwise, most people will not see anything because they are not used to the why question. They are not used to the objective question. And the objective question is a different logic, not Greek and not even systems thinking uh, because systems thinking has other elements other than the purposefulness. And, and therefore we're saying, okay, okay, put the objective on the side now and look at concepts. Look at the concept of marriage or the zawaj in the Quran. Look at the concept of hukum, governance. Look at the concept uh, of insan, the human. Look at that concept and see how you can understand the concept. But does this mean that you cannot look at the values as you look at the concept? Of course not. Like uh, al-hukum is also a value and is also an objective and is tied to a number of, of things. And therefore, we're talking here about network thinking, where connectivity, which is the introduction of the book, is the approach here. We are trying to connect. In the Quran, in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِيَا يُوصَلْ وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Corruption on earth happens when people start to sever the connections that Allah asked us to connect. But when we connect what Allah is asking us to connect, then we are reforming and we are bettering. We are doing islah. Uh, we, are, we cannot do islah if we are going to sever because we fall into apologism and partialism and the problems that uh, you would read about in, in that book. And therefore, there is no difference really between these elements and proofs, al-hujaj, the, 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 uh, the mantiq. Uh, and we said that the mantiq has to do with uh, the way a lisan, the tongue, uh, moves, and this would create meanings, and the meanings would create words that are concepts. Uh, and this mantiq is how you connect al-alamat bil haqaiq, how you connect the signs to the truths. How do you prove a certain truth? That is important to look at when you look at these elements in terms of proofs. And therefore, these elements are intersecting, and our objective is to have some sort of a network of ideas that would, inshallah, make you emerge new theories, new ideas, generate ideas, tawlid, um, or in Arabic, it's laboring, really, like it's laboring the ideas. Um, and a different creation emerged, Allah said, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This nasha'a yansha'u insha'an, or walada yawalidu tawlidan, two different dimensions of looking at emergence, what we call emergence in English, uh, is to labor something and give birth to something, or uh, construct an idea. We are calling you as researchers to construct ideas based on a network of elements that you read from the book of Allah based on this, based on the concepts, objectives, proofs, values, groups, universal laws, and commands. And when you have a journey with the book of Allah, and when you look at these things, again, these things are just training for you to differentiate between different angles of reading the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not divided into concepts and objectives and values like that because al-khair, good, al-khair. Al-khair is a value and an objective and a concept. And it's also a command, wafalu al-khair, do good, and, and so forth. So uh, the point is that you look at the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with every word has a value and has somewhere to take you, right? And this methodology that we are promoting is just, you know, aiding tools. It's just, you know, tools that would allow you to perhaps think in a deeper way. But if you want to produce research based on this emergence that we mentioned at the end of the book, in terms of the ideas and the theories that will emerge that we need as an ummah, you will have to go beyond the thinking of those seven elements. And you will have to look at the book of Allah as ayat, as signs. Signs for what? Alamat uh, or signs for haqaiq, for truths. And the mantiq and the, the tongue 
is going to lead you from the signs to the truths. And when you see the truths in any phenomena, you could start to suggest solutions for problems that you see. But you cannot start with a problem because beware of misdefining the problem. Um, you know, I've, I've so many students who come and ask about, okay, I have this research problem and okay, what is your research problem? Uh, patriarchy or uh, economic freedom or uh, anyway, like this is not, it's not a problem from the Islamic point of view, uh, you know, intellectual property and this kind of thing. Like sometimes people have a concept, objective slash value slash whatever you want to call it, that is a problem problematic in the society. It's problematic that um, the other day I was speaking with one of our uh, brothers, one of our students, and he is telling me the problem is the stability of the state. He's talking about one of the states uh, where there are like dynamics between the Islamic parties and the society and so on. Uh, and he was talking about the, you know, the problem of the state control and the state stability. I told him, this is Machiavelli's problem. This is not your problem. Who, like, you don't need the state to be stable if it's going to continue like that, <laughs> you know? And that is the Islamic point of view, Quranic view. The Quranic view, when you look at a particular thing, you don't have to go by the premises of different sciences. Uh, if you read uh, the... Um, the, the the Machiavelli's uh, the, the the other the other book the the prince and uh, the the other book the second book that he produced you will see that his problem was the stability of the state and the authority of the state and then he went on to talk about that as a Muslim you should not define the state this way uh, because the state in Islam if you read the Quran is al hukum governance and that's different and if you look at al hukum how do you deal with the state in order for the state to, to be an agent of good, of islah? Uh, you know, the siyasa shari'iyah, even in the old theories, uh, they said, المصالح المفاسد. the state is for increasing the maslaha and decreasing the mafsada. Uh, to, the stability and the control are tools. And therefore, this should not be, I told our brother, this should not be your objective from your research. What should be my objective? Well, the objective should be how can the state contribute to the society, not contribute to the, you know, the, the politicians. Like, how can the state better the society? Look at the phenomena of, like in, in this particular case, the phenomena of tribe, tribalism in that society and how the tribes could actually better the society. You don't have to have the official state authority working on every problem. Tribes is, is a system that works in some countries in a way that should do more politics. We should not withdraw the politics from the tribes and put it all with the state because we should go the other way around because that is not helpful. That will make the state more tyrannical. But if you take from the state to the tribes and make sure that the, the tribes are empowered and the syndicates of the professions are more empowered, then you are actually changing the political structure. But that's how, as a researcher, you are contributing to political science, rather than going by the problems that were defined by Machiavelli, really not, not us. So anyway, so I just wanted to share some thoughts with you. I'm looking forward to a discussion. And again, Zakwala Khair, Dr. Ildous, Dr. Mu'taz, and our brothers and sisters, the Maqasid Institute, for opening this forum. Uh, this is just, you know, some thoughts that uh, could uh, highlight part of, of my journey. But I'm expecting, inshallah, from our brothers and sisters, everybody who is attending now, uh, I'm expecting if you have some research to share, to share with us and you would like to discuss that, uh, please bring it to the research forum, apply to Dr. Ildous, and please present your work, and it's good that we all talk uh, about your research and give you our views. And uh, Barakallahu Fikum once again. I hope that this uh, added something and was useful in some ways to uh, promote some thoughts. Uh, Barakallahu Fikum. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. Jazakum Allah khairan Sayyidi. Thank you. Uh, we will take a break for five minutes and return back for a Q&A and contribution from the from the attendees and the colleagues here. Okay, so five minutes break, then we will return back, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Hi again, and we'll come back. In the second part, we will take uh, comments and contribution from other from, from participants here and and colleagues. So please, if you want to share your thoughts or ask any question, uh, raise your hand uh, or unmute your mic, or you can add that as a as a comment uh, on the chat. So please. Uh, if I may uh, invite uh, Dr. Basma Abdul Ghaffar, uh, one of the uh, of our participants, the vice president of the Maqasid Institute, and one of the people behind the idea of the research forum. Uh, who worked in uh, the kitchen of the Maqasid Institute to tell us a little bit about the research forum and, uh, of course, to comment or correct, as usual, any of the ideas. Barakallahu feekum. Please, Doctor. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, I, I have to uh, um, vindicate myself from that claim. It's uh, Dr. Ildous, mashallah, who is the uh, brain behind the research forum. I only agreed uh, very humbly to um, participate in the uh, forums as they um, take shape and as we choose speakers. So um, thank you for that, Dr. Ildous. is very stimulating. Thank you, Dr. Jesser, for a great presentation this morning. Uh, Dr. Jesser is always surprised by the fact that I do listen to his lectures and I do learn from them every single time. Uh, so mashallah and thank you. And of course, thank you for Dr. Mataz for uh, moderating. So. Um, the what I would add, or my understanding, because I've been working with the methodology for quite some time now in my own research, and the one thing that I think is very important to emphasize is that this is not network thinking, and it is not systems thinking. This is what I call ayet thinking, and we don't have a word for it in English because a verse is a it does an injustice to the actual meaning of an ayah and to the impact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for the ayat to have in the conscience of a believer. So when we read the Quran, we are thinking in terms of ayat. And this is a natural thinking process. This is actually the way humans think. We do not think in terms of isolated systems, components, or um, elements of networks or actors within networks, we actually think in terms of pictures and pictures that have depth, pictures that have ideas with them. And this is what and how the Quran approaches the human mind. So this is actually called ayat thinking um, or ayat reflection. It's not a, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the Western way of how we try to um, depict thought. So this process, what it does when, when you think of an ayah is, first of all, it impacts the, a human in a different way. It impacts you at the level of your conscience, not just at the level of your intellect, but it strikes at different levels. So it's not only giving you a narrative of a value or an objective or rule or a party. It's not only giving you a narrative about that, but it is situating that within your own consciousness. So you come out with a narrative that tells you about how things are in the world, but also how things should be. And no other text is capable of doing that at one and the same time. It's impossible. It's only the Quran that is capable of doing that. Only the Quran, when you read it, when you, when you begin to have this tasawwur, when you begin to have this envisioning of the world that the Quran talks about, does both have and happen within your conscience at the same time? So that when you're done the Quran, you have this understanding of what is a reality that exists, but also what ought to be. And it does it at the same time within the same ayah or set of ayat. So while each ayah contains the seven elements, right, that Dr. Jesser was just talking about, they are neither distinguishable nor necessarily distinct. That doesn't mean that they don't exist, but it means that 
in the way we think as humans, they coalesce. And they coalesce into what the methodology calls a web of meanings. They coalesce into lessons. And those are the lessons that when different people take them in with their different resources and different knowledge and different expertise and different histories, that they can bring them back into the world in a very different way. And that's the process of emergence. So your ability to see an aya, to understand the details of an aya, to connect it in distinct ways because of what it actually is, this will enable you to see new ideas for the purpose with which you are approaching the text. So if I were to add something, it would really be the emphasis on our understanding of the tool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran and that he encourages us uh, to understand. So an ayah, not just the written uh, words of the Quran, but Allah tells us that, you know, Sayyidina Isa was an ayah, his mother was an ayah, the narrative of Sayyidina Yusuf was an ayah, the life of Sayyidina Muhammad wasalam, was an ayah, all of these ayat in nature, ayat in the sky, these are all ayat. And so the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that we naturally think and that we ought to think is in that form. So this to me um, is the addition that I wanted to make this morning, which is akumullah khair, and I hope that it was useful. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jazakallah Khairan, Dr. Basma. Uh, okay, we have a contribution from both Ammar, Saeed, and Nasir. Uh, it's preferable to unmute your mic and share with us your, your contribution or question or comment. Uh, if you can do that, we, we can read your, your comments directly from the chat. So let's start with Ammar. Uh, maybe he's a panelist rather than uh, he's not a panelist with us. Not, not a panelist, but but yeah, perhaps uh, yeah. Oh, here he is. Here, but Ammar asked to unmute. Yes, Ammar or Nasir, we can. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam, rahmatullah. I'm Nasir Nazaria from Kaza, Nigeria. Allah Akbar. How are you, brother Nasir? Alhamdulillah, Prof. How are you, Prof? We are doing the. Jazakumullah khairan, sir. Barakallah fikum, sir. What I'm saying is that, uh, in fact, we are lagging behind here in our society. Uh, in fact, I never heard of this type of lecture, very interesting, like this one. I never see a scholar talking like this in our society here, sir. That's why I say we are lagging behind, and uh, in fact, we need. Uh, maybe a time whereby maybe a, ta a, a type of these uh, lectures, uh, maybe our scholars may be, uh, may be sponsored, maybe to be trained on this type of methodology so that they may be imparting the knowledge to our, uh, to our, to our people here in our society, sir. That is one, sir. Uh, the second one is that, sir, you have been talking of the PQ methodology, history methodology in the Quran, and so many um, uh, methodology in the Quran. So I am suggesting that that, that uh, maybe if there may be conferences that uh, maybe like uh, the conferences being uh, be, being organized by universities and so many places, the Makassi Institute uh, maybe will be organizing conferences with the teams containing Quranic methodology, so that uh, people may be encouraged to be researching on the teams on the different teams that are contained in the in the Quran. That is my say, sir. Jazakumullah khairan. Barakallahu feekum, barakallahu feekum. Akhi, barakallahu feekum. And uh, yes, inshallah, we're very interested in the training of scholars, as you mentioned. And if you have any project for this, <clears throat> the Maghassan Institute is an NGO that is trying to promote certain ideas. Uh, please connect with Dr. Idus, connect with our brothers and sisters, and uh, we can, inshallah, organize things for that. We have a number of members of the Maqasid Institute from Nigeria, in fact, and we can organize some of the training that you are talking about. And yes, we are interested in training scholars uh, rather than also talking in, in the public. And the other idea about conferences uh, related to the Quran, yes, that is also a very important idea. 
that we go back to the Quran as a reference and we ask people who work with that to uh, participate in these conferences. So these are suggestions that are welcome and barakallahu feekum. Please connect with our brothers and sisters of Maqas Institute and we can work together on that. Um, as, as for your comment that we don't see scholars speaking like that, it's, it's quite unfortunate because um, many of our scholars uh, would have critical ideas and would have similar thoughts, but this is not the voice that is usually given a platform. And this is a problem that every one of us is responsible to try to change, that let us try to bring platforms for the scholars of Islam that are centralizing the Quran, that are not afraid to critique some of the theories we had from the past, uh, the scholars who serve the ummah. You see, there are, in our history, ulama al ummah wa ulama al sultan the scholars of the ummah and the scholars of the sultan, right? Let us try to bring the scholars of the ummah forward. And the scholars of the sultan now are not just for the sultan, like literally, but they are sometimes, you know, the scholars of companies or the scholars of certain political parties or certain interests. And uh, they have a role, but we need to bring the scholars who have the interest in going back to the book of Allah and to dealing with Islamic knowledge in a critical way. That is critical, actually, for our for our uh, moving forward as an ummah. Allah Thank we you, have... Brother Nasser. And uh, we, wishing, uh, we are wishing uh, a peace uh, election in Nigeria in these days, inshallah. Uh, okay, I, 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 we have a question from Ammar, then we'll give the, the, the microphone to Dr. Hisham Muharram. Uh, Ammar uh, has a question, said, how will you, Dr. Jasser, suggest uh, one who wants to do an analytical study of, uh, of your book, Re-Envisioning Islamic Scholarship as a thesis? What oh, mashallah. Okay. As part of the thesis. Okay, first of all, consult with Dr. Mu'taz because he wrote uh, one of the chapters in his thesis to critique the Muqasid methodology. And I would uh, ask you to read that chapter uh, by Dr. Mu'taz. He wrote it in Arabic, though. And look at how you can critique it. So if you want to research that, I am honored that you are interested in researching uh, this book. But I want you to critique it uh, from within. Uh, what what are the elements from within that could be improved? And what is it in terms of a bigger project of trying to uh, re-envision the Islamic scholarship as the book is trying to say? Like how, how can you situate this research within the bigger picture of Islamic studies? And what is it trying to do in terms of the, um, if you wish, structures that we have, the intellectual and political uh, and academic, if you wish, more structures that we have, what is it trying to achieve? And wh what is the departure points between this project and the Maqasid al-Sharia traditional theories, which I wrote about maybe two decades ago now. Now, if you look at this book, I, I'm departuring from the Maqasid al-Sharia paradigm, the whole thing is not really, I critique it in, in everywhere in the book. And therefore, how can the Maqasid methodology compare to the Maqasid al-Sharia <clears throat> paradigm? And what is the benefit of that departure from the Maqasid al-Sharia paradigm to the Maqasid al-Quran paradigm? So these are just ideas for you. And of course, it's a forum. Anybody who would like to contribute, please uh, uh, go ahead. MashaAllah. Dr. Uh, Hisham Muharram. Ahlan wa sahlan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ahlan wa rahmatullah. Ahlan, Dr. Kif halakum jami'an. Hayak Allah, Dr. Jasser. Basically, I just wanted to kind of put the question out to everybody, including, uh, of course, yourself. Um, as we think of uh, engaging with the Maqasid uh, methodology in our uh, practice of Islam and engaging in our lives, um, I'm wondering if we could not uh, also try to develop um, means by which we can introduce it as a mindset, as an approach to life, 
to different age groups with different intellectual capacities, uh, such that as people get older and uh, their intellectual capacity increases, their engagement and uh, resulting output from a maqasid methodology mindset also uh, greatly increases. Uh, because uh, I'm, I'm wondering if we should wait until someone is older and then start to tell him uh, that there is something he should consider to reform his understanding and practice of Islam, et cetera, et cetera. It's called the Maqasid methodology versus introducing it actually in their thinking much earlier. And as they age, developing how they engage with it. Uh, would that not be something that could be fairly useful in the short term to get a lot more of the ummah uh, engaged in thinking this way? Yeah. Barakallahu feekum. This is a very important question because that is one of our challenges in the Maqasid Institute. We were just talking about it uh, this morning that this is for the intellectual mind rather than for everybody. And as you are saying, people who are not mature enough to be intellectual or to accept this kind of critique, and they still have a teenage mind or somebody in their 20s, and they're still developing their knowledge, uh, how can we introduce that? Uh, I think this is a very important question. One of the ideas we talked about before, Dr. Hisham, is about the farm that you are uh, that you have out there in America. And if you if you can bring people to the farm and make them think about farming in a maqasid perspective, uh, and and I I think that this is a brilliant idea to bring our youth to some sort of a retreat on a farm in order to think in a particular way and deal with nature and the reality in a particular way. So let us try to develop this idea. For example, Dr. Hisham, if we can try to develop that idea and bring these people, young people to your farm and, and show them how you apply the Islamic ideas to the agriculture uh, and you know the organic farming you talked to us about before, I, I think this could be a good idea. Inshallah, inshallah. Yeah, we have I, here. Sorry. Yes, sure, sure. If I may, on this question, again, we, we have to bring our education back to the concept of ayat. That's how we have to start educating our children. That, it, For instance, and this is a funny one, but some kids, for instance, think that chocolate milk actually is something in nature. Why? Because they don't think in terms of ayat. We don't teach them in terms of ayat. We don't teach them that this is part of a picture. And when you're younger, that picture can be more simple. It can be a more simple narrative. There can be the outdoor activities where we're constantly linking what the child is seeing with a creator, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that picture as a person that questioning, that understanding, that becomes more and more complex. And if you start there, if you start with the concept of the aya, the aya can be read on sur surface value, but then it can be read in connection with so many other ayat because ultimately all of the ayat connect in, in, in nature and in the Quran and in history and in time, everything connects. So as you go up, it becomes much more complex, much more detailed, much more mufassal. But as you're a child, it's still the concept of the aya. It's not the way that we teach children today in um, kindergarten and primary and secondary of everything being compartmentalized, everything you can take apart, everything you can look at in details. But what the Islamic approach or the aya approach would do again is to put everything always in a bigger picture and in a connected picture. And that you can start when the child is, is very young. So, so chocolate milk doesn't come from a specific cow, or like it's. That's what they. That's what they think. They actually did a survey, and kids think that chocolate milk is something. You know, they, they don't know it's milk, and some didn't even know it came from a cow. Some don't know milk comes from a cow. Milk is just a drink like Pepsi. Oh, okay. They they don't see the milk in and but, the chocolate. But you see, but you see, we're laughing. But if you think about it, if a child is born, and they're just given milk like a cup of water. 
and nobody tells them where this milk came from. How, so, how are they to know? They, they're not on farms. They don't see agriculture anymore. They don't know the links. So if you think about it, we take for granted the knowledge because we're adults. But a four-year-old who's never seen a cow and whose parents have never talked to them about where milk comes from, they're not going to know. So we have but, to go back to educating our children through the ayat. And that's what the Quran tells us. You know, right. So this is how we start. We start with the ayah. And we instill it within the breast of a child and it gets more complex as they get older. Uh, can I make a quick comment? Please. Yeah, um, in, in reference to uh, what Dr. Uh, uh, Abdullah Afar just said, um, it really is a, a, a result of the system that we, the majority of us are, are actually in submission to. The system dictates that we have the schools the way they are, the, the, the um, areas where we live the way they are arranged, the interaction with the natural world to the extent that it chooses. It's the system that does that. Uh, if you think about all those off-grid movements, the people that are talking about, you know, living off-grid, um, a lot of it has to do with them choosing to be more connected to the natural world and less dependent on the quote-unquote system. Uh, some of them uh, for economic reasons, some of them for personal freedom reasons, uh, some of them even for taxation reasons. But in the end, you look at the quality of life they live and the kind of human being that they often are able to raise, it is a much more aware individual, much more informed about the connectedness of life and the web of life around them. Um, they are very often not Muslim, but their outlook on life has so many similarities with, with what the Quran tells us we should have. So it's actually part of the, the results of the system that we are in submission to. How many of us living in homes constructed the quote unquote modern way and in urbanized areas or cities um, are really connected with the powers of nature as we call them. Uh, the wind, the rain, the, the, the soil, the, the, the web of life out there uh, that we sometimes see on our windowsill, but rarely really, really interact with. Uh, we live in a neon or a LED uh, air conditioned, uh, concrete walled uh, environment most of the time. And that contributes in my opinion to um, how there are so many people and that's even in developing countries to some extent in the urbanized areas are disconnected from the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them and the impact of human activities on the world that we so desperately depend on at the same time. Thank you all. Uh, we still have two questions uh, in the chat and three raised hands. So I will take the questions uh, in, in the chat. Uh, first of all, we have from uh, Nawaz from uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, he, he said, okay, how do you look at the Islamic moments and how can they play their role in the fiqh generation system? The Islamic movement? Yes, movements. Yeah, well, I think the Islamic movement uh, have to start to, um, to break the, the barriers uh, in terms of traditionism and imitation. Uh, the Islamic movement is very important, in my opinion, in the renewal of Islam because you have a group of people who have an organization anywhere in the world, east or west, south or north, you have an organization that is organizing itself for Islamic purposes. Usually these purposes are political and we need to shift the Islamic movements from the political purposes to, if you wish, the social purposes to work on the society rather than always look up uh, as, as leading the government. Because we really cannot lead 
a government well if the society has problems. So to focus on the society rather than the government and to focus on the deen, the original narrative of the deen, <clears throat> rather than on the whims of the people. The whims of the people are very dangerous for political, for, for Islamic movements. And I know that Islamic movements depend on the people for their funding, and therefore they play it safe and they appeal to traditionism and imitation and conservatism for the sake of the funding, because funders usually fund based on a condition of conservatism to keep the status quo. Um, but I think it's time for the Islamic movements to revise their strategies and decide to serve the ummah and focus on the ummah rather than serving the government and focusing on the government, serving the government in terms of alliance or opposition. Both are serving the government actually. And the Islamic movement has to open to the new ways of fiqh, the new movements of fiqh and the new thought in the al-fikr al-Islami or the Islamic thought. Otherwise, the Islamic movements are marginalizing themselves and are sentencing themselves to suicide. So just a very general answer for now. Yeah, another question from roughly Tri Ramadani. Okay. Yes. Uh, can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for a great presentation from Professor Chesser Auta. I'm a student from Indonesia. Uh, yes, and I, I, I know that you are one of the popular Islamic thinkers in, in my country since your dissertation has been translated to, into Indonesia. And I think it is quite uh honor for me to ask directly to you so uh the topic of multi multidisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity is uh, was old topic in my country because uh until you know uh, about professor amin abdullah he he also has the same concern with with this topic but uh, he approached uh, as a uh, islamic Islamic studies as general, not uh, it in particular. So I have one question for you. So you talk about that we have to move from multidisciplinarity to transdisciplinarity. And, but in fact, we can see nowadays that if we want to use some new approaches from natural sciences or social sciences, which came up from Western scholarship to use it, uh, as a tool to understanding Islamic texts, some Muslim scholars say that you should not use those Western knowledge because they came, they because they came up in the different worldview. So the majority of contemporary natural and social sciences are came up from liberal worldview, and this is contradict with the Islamic worldview. So how? Makassid methodology solve this problem and deal with this problem. Thank you very much. Barakallahu feekum, akhi. Barakallahu feekum. Um, yes, it is important to acknowledge that there, the, the academia today and the way knowledge is defined today is pretty much, as you put it, in Western scholarship. I don't normally use the East and West kind of thing, but it's true that European scholarship has classified knowledge in terms of humanities and social sciences and applied sciences and uh, so and natural sciences. And under humanities, you have disciplines, natural sciences, applied sciences, and so on. You have these disciplines. And it is the status quo of universities, East and West, Islamic and non-Islamic, that you go and study under applied sciences and study engineering and mathematics and so on, you study humanities and you study philosophy and history. So this is the status quo of academic studies today. What we are calling for, Akhi, is a reconstruction of that. What do we mean by reconstruction? We mean that you are from a certain discipline. We want you to learn the discipline well to the extent of redefining the discipline. 
And redefining the discipline has a number of steps. One of them is multidisciplinarity that you mentioned Prof. Amin, our brother, our friend there in Indonesia, talks about a lot, how to mix the disciplines. When you study economics, bring sociology and bring um, the, the law and bring other things so that you have a multidisciplinary study. But basically to restructure by going from multidisciplinarity to phenomena-based. Once you get into the phenomena-based studies, you are free from the disciplines. Even if the status quo forces you to take a degree in economics or a degree in political science or a degree in hadith or whatever it is, but once you study a phenomena, then you are going to give a different kind of, write a different kind of thesis and do a different kind of research. Um, and in, in that humble book, please read, you will see how I'm suggesting to reconstruct these disciplines. Uh, one, to look at the objectives of the discipline. What are the objectives of studying anthropology, for example? And how can we redefine the objectives of anthropology from the good old objectives that the Orientalists or the people, the colonialists of the past has put for, for the science of anthropology into a different kind of anthropology where the objectives are different. And then what are the concepts? The, you know, in anthropological studies, um, you have the concept of linear development of civilization, for example. Uh, this is a major core concept in anthropology. How can we, from an Islamic point of view, restructure that? Say that, no, we don't believe in a linear development of civilization. We believe in cycles of civilization. And how can we bring the uh, elements from the Quran uh, to restructure that? The concept of family, as they put it in anthropology, for example, they have an ideal family, which is the European family, and every other family is a primitive, they say, a primitive form of family, for example. Now, how can we put the Islamic family as the ideal, as Zawaj, the Islamic marriage that is, as an ideal form of marriage, and then the other forms of marriage are more primitive and are uh, less natural, etc. So how can we look at that this way? So my suggestion is to restructure the discipline you're in, even though your reality is that you are a student or a professor from a particular discipline. And in this restructuring, I suggest that you start by studying the phenomena rather than studying particular premises of the discipline. And when you get into the phenomena, bring in elements from different other disciplines, but make the Quran lead you towards freeing yourself from the epistemological basis and the silos of the discipline into a, an Islamic studies discipline that is not the imitation type, a wider and a much more open-minded Islamic studies discipline. Allah Alam. Yes, um, we have a question from uh, Tamur uh, asked about the, the book itself. Is it available in US? Yes, it's available, I think. And also it's available as an ebook. Isn't that? Yeah, yeah. yeah Please uh, connect, you connect contact with anyone, anyone of the Makassan Institute, or you can contact me or Dr. Uldus, and it's very easy to get I'm leaving my email here. I'm more than happy to uh, offer gifts from the book to our participants today. Just email me, please. I'll uh, I'll send you a gift, inshallah. Okay, uh, as time is too limited, we have a Bilal, Bilal Ahmad, he is a research scholar at University of Kashmir uh, and uh, specialized in the Islamic sociology. So, Bilal. And we have also... Until, Say brother, until brother Bilal comes, also brother Muhammad in Arabic here is saying that he is applying the Maqasid methodology or trying to apply it in a political science uh, research. And he is asking if he can send uh, his article for me to read and uh, my email is there I can read inshallah sometimes I'm delayed if I'm on travel or something but I can read and give you feedback inshallah for all of our participants I'm more than happy to connect uh, and if you have research 
uh, inshallah i'll do my best we have saif okay. and bilal saif and hafiz hafiz khan uh, yes hafiz here yes oh, here. Oh, brother hafiz alaikum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi uh this this particular project as it is now at this stage is really oriented towards um academics and researchers however i was looking at uh, there were a lot of people who are not exposed to makasib who might be involved in research and who are academics um, so I was thinking that if it is that there you could, could be developed some khutbas that could be given to khatibs throughout the world to, to, to start talking about and introducing the Makassid concept. I think that would help greatly in developing the whole process throughout the world. Because it, it is at that level, once it is accepted, right? Whereas on the other hand, the scholars who are reaching out to those people at that level, they are taking them down a different track. And I know that once we get to Khatibs, they would be willing, and when they, it is about bringing about truth, then they would be willing to spread the word. And the more we spread the word at that level, we'll find that the blossoming of the Bakasid concept and the persons willing to find out what it is about would, would be improved vastly. And we will find that we will have exponential growth in, in, in the development of Mukassid methodology. MashaAllah, Barakallahu Fikum, Akhi, Stad Hafiz. This is a brilliant suggestion uh, for Khatibs to embrace the Mukassid methodology thinking and to give khutbas based on that. Um, as I talked about the Islamic movement, I could talk about mosques as well. It's quite uh, quite a challenge for mosques to raise the bar uh, of the topic of the khutbah because the mosques, uh, sometimes they go by the policies of a state if the state is a Muslim majority kind of country and therefore they wouldn't get into this critical talk uh, about Islam uh, even though I think we need it very much. Uh, and the pressure of the masses as well. Uh, I give khutbas sometimes here in Toronto or in different countries or around the world. And if the khutbah is not the usual simple khutbah and I'm raising the level of the discourse to our brothers and sisters in the masjid uh, talking about a particular issue, uh, I always find that... Uh, director of the mosque or the organization that opened the mosque will tell you, okay, let us avoid the controversial issues. And, uh, uh, give khutbas, give a series of khutbas in Toronto on uh, women and Islam and the rights and so forth, and how we should look at the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, dealing with uh, women in Islam in a particular way. And I have a humble book called Reclaiming the Mosque. I gave this book in series of khutbas and I was uh, pleased by the uh, impact, inshallah, uh, on, on the society because we need some of these ideas. But the bit of criticism that I gave to some of the hadith narratives and so on uh, caused me for the directors of the mosque to tell me, well, no, no, let, let, us, let us be basic. And I told my brother, I don't want to speak to people as if they are five or six years old. I want to speak to them as mature people. Let us, why do we speak about Islam to people as if they're children? Let us raise, raise the level and say, yes, there is a hadith that people call sahih, but it's not if it's going to allow you to mistreat your family or your wife, or da, da, da. But subhanAllah, so it's a bit of a challenge, but it's a brilliant suggestion. And if you have a number of khatibs that you want me to speak to, I'm more than happy to speak to them, inshallah. Barakallahu feek. Uh, brother Saif, and then Muhammad, yes. Muhammad uh, Ba'um. Can you hear me? Yes. Ahlan, ahlan. Brilliant. Assalamu alaikum, Professor Rauda. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much for the stimulating talk. So I'm a student at the IKI Academy, student of Dr. Ildus. So thanks to him for uh, 
this in invitation. Uh, brilliant lecture, brilliant talk, really yeah. stimulating ideas. Yeah. And the yeah. framework that you introduced uh, seems to be critically important for the Muslim scholarship. So my question is twofold. Uh, firstly, can you give us an example of uh, implementation of Maqasim methodology and how such implementation can or has drawn different results uh, compared to, for example, a uh, logical pos positivist methodology or a feminist methodology and so on. And the second uh, part of my question is, can you also comment upon the decolonial value of the Mikasid methodology or Aya thinking, uh, given that the hegemony of Eurocentric frame frameworks in the knowledge production in humanities or hard sciences is like air that we breathe? Uh, thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah uh, in, in terms of examples, um, it, there are there there is a um, there is a movement of renewal that we have in different parts of the world, and I could claim that there are people who are impacted by the methodology. It, it's um, it's not that I would give some sort of an ijaza that this thesis is methodology uh, compliant or not sharia ah, methodology compliant or not it's not about that but i could see people impacted by the methodology and i wouldn't think about it in terms of and an end product or a line of production and then a solution creation kind of um, approach it's not it's not about that because the solution creation is in itself uh, anti-thinking of the methodology. The methodology is not trying to find solutions. The methodology is trying to shift the consciousness to somewhere else. Because once you define the problem in terms of solutions, so you want me to tell you that because they applied the Maqasid methodology and they centralized the Quran, now the farm is producing more crops or the... Uh, the, the environment is less corrupt by certain number of tons of carbon. I wouldn't be able to do that because the, the objective is to shift the consciousness of the people. And when the consciousness is shifted, then the environment will be better. Do you see what I mean? So I, I don't have a particular, uh, yes, of course, I don't have a particular example to give you, but for example, uh, Dr. Basma Abdul Ghaffar is actually applying uh, the methodology and critiquing it as well in her research. And the decolonialism through the ayat, she would be the best to talk about it, please. Yes, Dr. yes please, because, because I, I sent to her via a private message if she can handle the second part of this. Yeah, of course. Oh, yes, mashallah. We think the same. We think the same. Uh, I, I think I, I can give an example um, because you actually did point out feminist theory, which is not something I've worked on, by the way. I'm um, originally not from that background, I'm science and technology. However, um, because of the nature of the ayat, again, it forces you to um, educate yourself about much wider areas and to deepen your knowledge. And my latest research, which is maybe about three years now or a bit more, uh, is involved with um, feminist ideas and theories. So I'll give you an example of where this methodology can take us and how beneficial it is. So there's been, and I'll try to do it in a nutshell, and then we can maybe do it in another forum more expanded later. So we have, for instance, something called, some of you may have heard, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or SIDAO, and it's been creating a ruckus all over the world. Now, it's been doing this for predominantly Muslim societies or governments that are coming in with this and non-state actors because they've been doing one of two things, either accepting the agreement uh, with reservations or rejecting it. Now, in both cases, they're drawing on traditional fiqhi arguments. Both of them are using the same toolbox. Some are saying it works for these reasons in our heritage and in our fiqh, and some are saying it doesn't work for those reasons. Now, what does the methodology do? The methodology says this is very confusing for people, and you cannot come from an Islamic perspective and have diametrically opposed opinions, because that's not the way the Quran and the guidance of the Quran works. So you begin to question, what is it that the agreement is trying to do? And the foundation of that agreement is this 
conflict that women have with men, that their relationship is conflictual and the problem is equality. So we all have to be equal and we work towards the equality of women. And that's the injustice that's occurred in history. Now, coming from the Maqasid methodology, you would ask yourself, is that the case? You have to even question that fundamental. Is the problem equality? And when you read the Quran, and you've done enough tadabur, you will realize that the Quran only talks about something we call concepts with sultan, or an authoritative truth. So if something doesn't have sultan, the Quran will either negate it, or it will, if it has sultan, it will explain it. So the concept of equality is actually negated in the Quran. There is no concept of equality. Okay, so it's negated maybe twice in the Quran as uh, but there is no equality. So what does that mean it, between men and women in nature? What does that mean when Allah explains this to us? Well, we replace, when you study from this methodology, we replace the concept of certainty of equality with ignorance of worth. Because when we situate the human in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not in equivalence to other elements within creation, then it becomes ignorance of worth. And Allah tells us this in the Quran. Do not let one people belittle another or condescend another or a, women, a group of women to condescend another group of women lest they be better than them. And so the concept that Muslims would come with is ignorance of worth. I will treat you based on the fact that I do not know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perceives you or your actions or your life's work. And that is the difference between certainty of equality and ignorance of worth. Now, when we work with the premise of ignorance of worth, we have to ask, well, then how do we treat people? The Quran responds to that as well and says we treat them with dignity, not with equality. There, equality does not equal dignity. And I'll give you an example that Sidao gives quickly, and I'll end with that. So Sidao would say, if you have a factory that is dark at night, then the factory uh, is not going to employ women because it's dangerous for them and they can be violated. So their answer is something called substantive equality. Well, let's put lights in, around the factory and uh, let's provide transportation so that women can work at night. Uh, but this is equality. This is not dignity. There is no questioning of why does a woman have to work at night? Why does she have to leave her room, uh, her home? Why does she have to risk being violated? There, that is not asked by Sidao. Sidao just says, let's make it equal for them so they can also work at night. And that's very problematic. So the Quran comes along and says, no, it's not equality that's the issue. It's ignorance of worth, and then we treat people based on dignity. And if we treat people based on dignity, this is a very different paradigm. So that's one example of how the methodology can then come when we're in these negotiations internationally, when we're talking about agreements like this, why we reject them from a basis not that adds no value, but that says, okay, what is the alternative? Why are we rejecting it? What is the logic? Let's persuade people and then let's come out with the policy recommendations and alternatives that are more in line with the ayat and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's just one example. And inshallah, we can spend you know, time on others. But I just wanted to show you how that can have practical implications for something like this. I'd like to comment on this. Zakir Lakhir, the Qura Basma, for the work you do. I'd like to comment on this uh, to continue my answer to my brother, uh, Stad Saif that what Dr. Abasma has produced now in terms of this one idea of moving from the equality premise to the dignity premise and uh, it, the, the new angle that she's looking at the women issues from is different from the solution-based views. The solution-based views would tell you that putting lights around the factory as the Sidao is saying, is the maqasid thinking. But we call this apologetic thinking. We say that sometimes the maqasid is used to um, establish the status quo, even though it is supposed to be used to reconstruct and challenge and um, deconstruct before reconstruct the status quo. 
So what she is saying is actually reconstructing the question to start with so that we have a Quranic approach to it. But apologists who apply the Maqasid al-Shari'ah paradigm would tell you, oh, the Maqasid is good because uh, you are putting more lights around the factory and this is have the nafs so that women who go and work at midnight in the factory have a nafs, their nafs protected, their life is protected, and therefore this is kind of have the nafs. We challenge that. We say that using the maqasid for uh, these kinds of answers is actually not what Muslims need, what the ummah needs. Uh, a very similar approach to what is called the tamwil al-islami or the Islamic finance. A lot of it is like that. It's actually just playing around the capitalist system and bringing elements from Islam in the name of the maqasid to establish the capitalist system more. But our approach challenges the system from the core. And therefore, we want to challenge the definition of money uh, in terms of riba. And we want to challenge the dependence on uh, the central institutions in terms of fiscal uh, policies. And we want to challenge, like, you see, so my point is that this methodology could be taken on different levels and could be applied partially for the sake of training, you see, but it is not a partial methodology and it's not an apologetic methodology. And it doesn't aim to produce solutions as in material numbers to prove its worth, but it's aiming to change the paradigm. The, for example, in the example that Dr. Basma gave, you might not produ produce the same production. You will have less production if you give women dignity. Uh, and because you are not allowing them to work 24 hours. And, and that is not good for the economic indicators, but it's good for the Islamic indicators that are different from the economic indicators. I just wanted to add that comment on the research she does, and we're looking forward to a presentation on that within the research forum, inshallah. Zakullah khair. Malish, I hope to, I hate to interrupt, but can I uh, answer uh, Mr. Fadl, Will, Mr. Wilmont? Or, sure. Because the question is directly related to what I said. Sure, please go ahead. And, and I often get it. So the Quran indicates that both what he's saying, men and women are spiritually equal. First of all, the Quran does not say that. The Quran states those who do good, whether male or female, and have faith will enter paradise and will never be wronged, even as much as the speck of a date stone. Sure, but that does not equal equality. When Allah, it doesn't mean, you see, the problem is because we're stuck in this paradigm that equality of men and women is, is the issue. Men and women are not compared in Islam. Their, their relationship, their value is in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What these ayat are telling us is not that they're equal. One is less or one is more than the other. But that that value is determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not between an equivalence between human beings. So when an ayah says something like this, there's nothing in there that indicates equality. The only thing in there that is indicated is that they will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some more than others, some less. Not all spirits or souls are equal on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just have to read the Quran to realize that. It's not a men versus women. It is women and women and men and women and other things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, Exactly. So even our equivalence, maybe a mountain has greater spiritual value with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than me. Maybe a fly has greater spiritual. I don't know. He hasn't told us. We don't have those details in the Quran. He just wants to humble us. So there is no equivalence of anything created in the Quran. The, when he says something like this, he is making a promise that should any of you be heedful, that you will have your place in paradise. But he's not saying that men and women are equal when he states this subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. He's not saying that one is more than the other or one is better than the other. The problem with male thinking and Western thinking is there's always the default that then the male is better. This is not true. This is not true. There is no equivalence because we don't know who is better. And it's the ignorance of worth that is going to make these ayat the reality because our worth is in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when women begin realizing that, they're going to take ownership 
of يأمرون بالمعروف بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض when Allah said subhanahu wa ta'ala he made some of them better than others the ayah in surah an-nisa 34 is not saying that men is better than women it is saying ar-rijal qawwamun ala an-nisa'i bima faddala Allah ba'dahum ala ba'd he did not say bima faddala Allah ar-rijal ala an-nisa' and it's always in the tafsir that ar-rijal are better than an-nisa' and it's not like that he said ba'dahum ala ba'd some men are better than some women and some women are better than some men and there is no equality. The word equality doesn't exist there. It is read in an apologetic way in the ayah. I know we got into one example very deeply, but that's an application of the methodology. Inshallah, some other time perhaps. Inshallah. Thank you. Muhammad. Yeah, we will take, inshallah, the last uh, comment from Ahmed Ba'oum. Sorry, if time is limited. So sorry, sorry if there is... Uh, and uh, that we can't, we can't take all the questions. Yes, Muhammad, brother. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Jasser, for this timely topic. My name is Muhammad Ba'oum. I'm doing my PhD in Industrial and System Engineering. And I could share part of your journey, actually, because I'm, I studied also social science and I have interest in Islamic studies and got introduced to interdisciplinary from a Western perspective. So it's very nice to find a scholar coming to it from an Islamic perspective. I, I think I have one suggestion. Uh, if, if and, and I understand you don't want it to make it like uh, a tool. Uh, or certificate, but it might be very helpful uh, to compile maybe a couple of papers from different fields that would have the spirit or at least the, the ideals that this methodology is calling for, uh, because people usually think through examples and it's very easy to take three through courses and you still, you can contribute and criticize. And especially I would say in engineering and science, people usually think that it is applied and doesn't have value while it's really embedded in Western value today, it's technology and science. And many of our Islam, Muslim scholars actually who are coming from the natural or applied science, they are re rarely aware about this biases and, and the way that if they brought their perspective, they can contribute hugely to, uh, to these fields. And I think now the Western even academia are ready to, re to hear these voices. So they are open to to they are they are they are looking for for people from different parts of the world to criticize the the Western paradigms and bring their perspective, and and I think there are different in different fields you might find some examples, or maybe you can call the Makassar Institute might call for scholars from different field to to scan and then uh, nominate uh, some papers, uh, like what Dr. Abd Al Masiri did in Ishkarit Tahiyus I think. His two books in Islam, I think it was very, very helpful to, to make the, the idea clear and then also to, to make it move forward. And I think it will enrich the discussion. Inshallah. Inshallah. Izaakallah khair. A very good idea. Inshallah, eventually we will have this international conference uh, about Maqasid methodology. And it's an idea, inshallah, that we are discussing in the Maqasid Institute. Izaakallah khair, akhi. Barakallah fiq. Be in touch, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, all of you and uh, thanks a lot uh, Sheikh Jasser for being with us and thanks Dr. Basma for your contribution and for uh, Dr. Aldous for uh, for managing and uh, steering this session. I would like finally to uh, share with you some short announcements. Uh, we have inshallah in the upcoming months uh, uh, course uh, under the title Tadabur al-Quran. We will, we will announce that uh, soon inshallah so keep following up our uh, social media platforms and the website and also the next session in this uh, forum or in this series will be with dr baptiste uh, next month inshallah uh, the specific uh, date and and time it will be already uh, also announced on the on the website and uh, via our social media platforms for whom attend this session uh, uh, lately, they can watch the the, the the record. This session is is already recorded and it will be published. Isn't that, Doctor Ildus? Yes. 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 Exactly. Yeah, it will be published also uh, on the website and also the social media. Thank you all for being with us. It was great two hours with uh, with great discussion and th thanks a lot for being with us. We will keep in touch, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. أستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Please Dr. Ildous
Yeah, the, those who are, uh, I think some of uh, our uh, students from the second cohort, don't forget that we have a session tomorrow, our, wow. our second live session tomorrow, inshallah. So uh, please attend that. Uh, so this was a short announcement to those uh, students who are in our second cohort at the Makassar methodology course. But everyone else, I mean, you're uh, free and please do uh, contact me. And I know that some of the students from IKI Academy, uh, they were here and uh, uh, you please do uh, contact me. And if you have some questions, I know some of you have not been able to uh, uh, maybe ask your questions. Do uh, you can contact uh, uh, Professor Jasset and uh, Professor Basma also. Uh, you can contact them directly. So we have uh, their contacts, emails and everything. And uh, do contact me if you cannot uh, get them. I will get them for you, inshallah. The All last right. note, inshallah, we will, inshallah, in the future, after the ones we've arranged an entire session on this issue of women, bi'iznillah, and uh, we'll invite some of the speakers that we, we saw in the chat, bi'iznillah, to join in, in such a panel uh, and clarify some of these issues, inshallah. Thank you. khair and Ramadan Kareem for everybody, inshallah. May Allah bless you, Ramadan. And we'll be in touch, inshallah, before Ramadan with uh, uh, our fellow uh, Dr. Baptiste Brudar and the research he did as an example on the Maqasid methodology. And inshallah, post Ramadan, we will continue our series uh, with Dr. Mu'taz. Uh, he will also uh, give us a lecture on and the maqasid methodology and afterwards inshallah barakallahu feekum assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah